Robert Toporek was in the Army during Vietnam War. Where were you when the Vietnam War began, when you first became aware of it? How old were you and what were you up to in life? I didn't even know there was a Vietnam War. <laughs> I was um, 17 and I was not doing well in school and I was failing the 11th grade for the second time. My mother just about had it with me. And around um, Christmas and Hanukkah, she gave me three choices. I could get a job, go to a trade school, or join the service. So I put two and two together. I was always looking for ways to get out of the house. And so a bunch of my buddies from high school had dropped out of high school and joined the service. So I, it was a no-brainer. I just decided to join the Army. And I grew up watching Audie Murphy movies and World War II movies and all that stuff, you know? And so it kind of looked glamorous to me. And I, uh, that was, a, you know, the Green Berets were really popular in those days and all those Green Beret movies and stuff like that. So I wanted to prove how tough I was, so I wanted to be a Green Beret. So I joined and I told them I wanted to be a Green Beret. And um, I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> and. Um, well, what did they say when you said I they wanted said, to be sure, a Green Beret? You know, it, you know, you could be a Green Beret. But they forgot to tell me that I had to have a high school diploma to be a Green Beret and that I was going to go to jump school. I didn't even know what jump school was. I'd actually never been in an airplane before. So um, I ended up um, just mindlessly going through the steps and I went to Fort Jackson for basic training. I went to Fort Gordon for advanced infantry training. I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> and then I went to Fort Benning for jump school, nor did I have any idea what that meant. Now jump school was because you wanted to be a Green Beret? I wanted to be a Green Beret, and to be a Green Beret you had to become a paratrooper first. But I, had, I couldn't become a Green Beret because I didn't have a high school diploma. So I just became an airborne paratrooper. And um, I got orders to go not to Vietnam, to Okinawa. And so, what um, was the state of the the Vietnam conflict at that point? I don't th it, well, when I got, I think they just had some advisors there for the, to tell you the truth, because I was being. So sent you really to, didn't know that you I were really about didn't know to be. That, well, there was no. We ended up being the first Army ground combat troops to go to Vietnam, and we went to, uh, the 173rd was stationed on Okinawa. That's where they were sending me to, and that would have been a dream. Like, if there was no Vietnam War, that would like be a dream assignment because Okinawa is really beautiful and you get people to come shine your shoes and clean your bunk and stuff like that. And um, we were actually sent to Vietnam on a 90 days temporary duty. So and it really wasn't even wartime. It wasn't even wartime. It wasn't even wartime yeah. So what was basic training like for you? You were 17, were you ready for the physical part of it? I made it through. <laughs> what about the mental part of it? You made it through. You know, it's just, it's, you know, you're 17 years old. You're from Charleston, South Carolina. You've never really been anywhere, or done anything, and you know they give you a uniform and you just follow the rules and uh, go through the motions. I didn't put a lot of thought into it. And um, <laughs> if you check with my buddies from Vietnam, they will say that when it comes to being a soldier, I was probably the worst person that ever was in the army. <laughs> In terms of being out in the field, they said they, you know, they trusted me completely. But you know, I mean, I was I was I was not one of those like um, rah rah army guys, and I wasn't a rah rah paratrooper. You just kind of go along with the singing the songs and doing the marches and doing the runs and you know proving that you can make it, because the last thing you want to do is not make it. And um, so, talk about jump school. What what did that entail? Did you? have any fear of heights or f getting never, up in planes? I've never or? been in an airplane. So you no. didn't even know if you had a fear? I didn't know. <laughs> well, um, when you get up there, you know you have a fear. <laughs> and um, what happened was um, that uh, when I was little, we used to jump out of trees, you know, like Tarzan. We had trees and we had we we had tree houses and we were swinging out of the trees. So I kind of d didn't have a fear of heights per se, but I didn't have any idea of what it was going to be like to jump out of an airplane. And my first jump, I ended up being first person in the door. 
So here I am, I think I just turned 18, and I'm standing, the, you ever, you've been on airplanes before, can you imagine the door opening up? <laughs> no. And, no, I can't either. <laughs> and there I was standing in the door, and I'm looking at this beautiful earth. It was like the first time I'd ever seen something like that. And so I was maybe there for maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds. And I knew that in a, you know, at some point the green light was gonna go on, somebody's gonna tap me on the shoulder. So there I am. First time I've ever been in an airplane, standing in the door, looking at the earth, and um, I know that there's 50 people behind me, and this is not the right time to say, I don't want to go. Because <laughs> there were stories about how they'll throw you out if you don't jump. So, and then there's this thing called the green light. And I imagine there were stories of people getting in that position and freezing. They were. And you know what they do? They go around and then they throw you out. So there were people that didn't want to go, but they didn't have a choice, because once you're in the airplane, you're gonna become airborne. So uh, anyway, the first flight, first jump was kind of cool, and you jump out, and you know, you're floating down, and then you have to land, and there's a certain way you have to land, and I learned how to do that. You fall down and kind of like roll over, and then pick yourself up and go on. And then there was um, one of the jumps, I remember them saying, if you land on someone else's chute, just stand up and walk off it. But they didn't tell you that when you do, that all the air from your parachute is gonna be sucked up by that, by that one, <laughs> and you're gonna drop. And so I started dropping and it was like, holy smoke, what do I do now? And then all of a sudden it caught on, the chute cut, you know, opened back up, and I landed. So that was um, the adventure of being a paratrooper. And you know, the cool thing about it is you get to, where you're, you're certain little, I think you have to, you can have your pants rolled up and you, you, you're supposed to be a badass. <laughs> <laughs> that was what people That's what, could and, see, and they you could know, see you, were, you and know that, that you were a paratrooper. There's a difference between a paratrooper and a leg. A leg were people that just walk around, paratroopers jump out of planes and do all these strange things. And then there was uh, one jump that we did in Vietnam that I remember, and um, I remember landing, and I think I cracked the rib. I've cracked my ribs a number of times, so looking back, I can remember what happened. Must have hit a rock or done something, but I cracked my rib, and I was certain that I was dead because <laughs> I could barely breathe. And um, and that was all the adventures of paratrooping, uh, being a paratrooper, except that. We were part of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and the, it was called the 173rd Airborne Brigade separate, so we were like a separate army. So we weren't like the real army, we had, we had our own little army. So you, you said um, when you got your orders to go to Japan, or yeah, Okinawa, Okinawa. Yeah. was it, you said it was just gonna be a 30 day temporary mission? 90 day temporary 90 mission. 90 day, yeah. now where were you leaving from to get to Okinawa? Well, I think I got a 30-day leave after jump school or a two-week leave or something. Then we went to um, California, I think Oakland or Oakland or San Francisco, I don't remember exactly. And um, there were thousands of people that they were shipping out then. And um, I don't know where they were shipping them to, but that's kind of like where they ship people from. And um, every morning they would have a big formation and they would count off 100 people, you're going, you're going, you're going. And one morning they called out like 1,000 people and they said, you're taking a ship. Now, there's nothing worse. <laughs> it, I think the Thin Red Line or some one of those movies had, you know, like guys going to overseas on a ship. It's nothing worse. What it kind was, of ship was it? I don't know. <laughs> it's a big, big ship with a lot of people. And we went out the night before, we all got drunk. I think we'd gotten paid or something, we all got drunk. I just never forget this. And um, what they were serving was, you know those little Lipton noodle soups with the, with the little, you know, little noodles? They had that. They had hot dogs and sauerkraut. And I was starving, so I ate a lot of it. And then the ship started to take off, mm -hmm. and I was up top. I was sick for 21 days. It was the most <laughs> miserable ride I've ever had. So and that was 21 days 20, across the Pacific 21 Ocean. 21 days across the Pacific. We stopped one day in Hawaii, 
and we got off the ship and we were walking around and it was like like that and on on solid ground you on still solid felt ground, like we're that we're still going like that and then we went to Guam one to, we stopped in Guam and uh, I think we got to wash our clothes or something like that that was a big array of that and then we got to Okinawa so you said there were about a thousand troops was, on that were, one at least ship. a thousand people on that ship and I don't remember a single one you don't remember who any of that because you were a single person in such a bad state right and um, you had chores to do my chore took 15 minutes so I just pretty much hung out and was sick the whole time what was your chore sweeping down a stairwell and uh, so when you got to Okinawa, what was your... Oh, well, the interesting thing about getting to Okinawa, before I go back, what, a friend of mine had dropped out of high school two weeks before I did, and he was an amazing athlete, and he could have gone to any college he wanted to, and he dropped out, and I never knew why. And I gave him grief about it, and then two weeks later, I'm right behind him. Oh, you guys met up in, no, uh, in the Army? So, no, so then, in, jumps, in, in basic training, one day, I'm, he doesn't remember this, but I do, sitting outside the barracks, he comes walking along, we chatted for a while, and it's like, wow, what's the likelihood of that happening? Not real high. I go to jump school, and I'm standing in formation. There's this guy yelling out the window, don't smile at me, I'm not your dentist. Really? John Lockwood. <laughs> Hurt his ankle, he had to stay back. We moved on, and I get to Okinawa, and I go into this little room to get my orders. Who do you think has my orders? John Lockwood. <laughs> So you keep said, running into one of your said, friends from home. He said, you're going to Vietnam. He said, you're going to Company B. That's not a good deal because you're replacing a lot of people that just got killed. Ooh, that's when it started getting a little bit serious. And then we landed at Tonsonut Air Base. Well, how long were you in Okinawa before you found out? Not very long. Couldn't have been more than a couple of days. And um, then they flew us over to... Tonsonut Air Base. You, know, you can imagine being an 18-year-old. You've never been away from home, and you're landing at this major air base, and there's all these jets flying around, and helicopters flying around, and Army guys walking around with guns, and tanks rattling around. And the first inclination is, mm, this does not look like a good idea. I think I'm going to call my mom and see if I can come back home. But that wasn't uh, real, so... Um, then they put us in a truck and took us to uh, Company B. And then I got there, and um, we're in formation. And they said, um, does anybody know how to drive a Jeep? And I said, is it a stick shift? They said, yeah. I said, I can do it. I've never driven a Jeep before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I didn't. they said, okay, you're going to be the company commander's Jeep driver. Well, that sounds pretty cool. And how do you start this thing? So there's a little button on the floor that you have to push to get it started. And uh, I learned how to drive the Jeep, and for about a week or two, I was um, the company commander's Jeep driver. And I was a maniac, and I was driving down these dirt roads and going pretty fast and carrying these officers. And one day, I was uh, taking them to Benoit or something like that and hit this bump. This one officer said, hey, you missed one. I said, don't worry about it, sir. I'm going to get that on the way back. <laughs> you missed the bump? <laughs> he got really mad. <laughs> and then what happened? Um, oh, they forgot to tell me that not only was it going to be the company commander's Jeep driver, but I was going to be the radio operator. Now, do you think I had a clue how to be a radio operator? That wasn't what you were I was were not trained. trained to be a that radio operator. And, um, and then we... I don't think I'd been there more than a week or two, a couple of weeks or something like that. And they said, okay, buckle up. We're going to go uh, in the field. I had no idea what they were talking about. I didn't know what kind of equipment I needed. I was like really a novice at this whole war thing. And they, <clears throat> most of the people there at that time had been on Okinawa for maybe a year, some of them longer, some of them shorter, but they'd already been training to do jungle warfare and stuff like that. And we were the first replacements for the people that were being sent back home or had gotten killed or wounded. But you guys hadn't been trained in no, jungle we, warfare no, absolutely or not. any of that? No, no. We had no clue. And um, so somebody helped me get all this equipment together and we're out in the jungle and we're walking around 
and I've got stuff falling off my belt, and people are like, something wrong, something wrong. With Radio this guy. equipment. Something wrong with this guy. Well, hangar days were falling off, and ammo was falling off, and it was I was pretty sloppy. And um, they were not too happy with me. And then one day we're walking along, and um, you know when somebody calls, you're supposed to say, I'll see if Tango Tango can talk to you. I didn't say that, so I'll see if Captain Lombardo is available. <laughs> <laughs> and he heard me. He said, get that guy out of here. So so how long were you the radio guy? I wasn't very long. And it was a good thing. Because during that year, we lost three company commanders, three or four company commanders, and three or four radio operators. And um, so they sent me down to um, the 3rd platoon in the weapons squad. And that's where I stayed for the whole rest of the year. So what was the job there, the, the weapons I was squad? A, I was an ammo bearer for a machine gun team. We had two machine guns, and uh, we had uh, two machine gunners, and each one of them had three or four people, and those people carried all the ammo for the machine guns. So the weapons squad, what was their job, the squad itself? What it was, was a machine gun squad, essentially. And now? we had probably, I think we had some grenade launchers, and but... Did you, so had you been trained with all the weaponry or? Supposedly. <laughs> I would not, you know, you know how some guys are like outdoorsy people? I was not exactly the outdoorsy kind of person. You know, some guys had, uh, had already been hunting, you know, most of their life. I'd never hunted anything except with a BB gun. And um, so to say that I was prepared to be out in the jungle doing this stuff, uh, I wasn't. But. You know, it's called on-the-job training. You learn really fast. And so you, so where were you stationed at that point? We were uh, outside of Benoit, uh, which was a little bit south of Saigon. And we, our base camp was, um, when we moved, when we first got there, we were living in tents and, you know, like pump tents. And then we, it was a rubber tree plantation, so we cut down all the rubber trees. And then they built real tents, and um, they were basically just wooden floors. And then the tent got built on top of the wooden floor. So essentially, there was no air conditioning, running water. There were no washing machines, dishwasher. <laughs> there were no shower, showers. You had to walk up to the, um, the mess hall, fill up these big um, gas tanks of water bringing back, dump them into a barrel, and then that's how you took a shower when you're in base camp. When you're out in the field, you didn't take showers. And you mentioned the mess hall. What were the meals like? Oh, they were good when we had them, but we weren't there that much. Most of the time, we were eating sea rations out in the field. And what were they like? Oh, they were delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so you said um, you would go out in the field. So how often would you go out, and then how long would you be out for? That's a hard thing to answer, because um, there are periods that I remember and periods that I don't. And um, and before we go any further, I'll tell you a story about this. I didn't talk about Vietnam for 20 years. So when I came back, it was at the height of the um, anti-war movement. I think I came back in 19, I got out in 1968, I came back in 67, late 67. I was at Fort Jackson in South Carolina for a few months, and I was training. Um, I was training um, people to go to Vietnam or to go to war or whatever. And um, during that first year, half of my squad got killed or wounded. Some of them right in front of me, and there were repercussions of that that I just buried. And um, and it's taken me this long to begin to even deal with it. Totally. And um, so, I don't know, we would go out two or three weeks, come back for a week or two, go back for another two or three weeks. We were always going on, when we were even base camp, we were always going on uh, um, patrols, uh, you know, like every every third or fourth day, our squad would have to go on a patrol out beyond the base camp to make sure that the base camp never got attacked. So your squad, how many people were in it? Depend on what day. <laughs> <laughs> One time, 
we had so many people in our squad that we had to tie bunks to the rafters. About a week or two later, we took them all down because half of those people got killed or wounded. Um, and I don't remember exactly when that was, but I remember that whole process of doing that. Um, and let's see. So you said you would go out on patrols. What were what was the purpose of these patrols? They were cert well, mostly they were listening patrols to make sure that nobody came and snuck in and attacked our base camp. So when we were in base camp, that's a patrol that we had to go out and make sure that the Viet Cong weren't infiltrating our base camp. And there was a refugee village that the second year I was there, I ended up working in. And our job was to keep that village, they called it a pacification project, because what the Viet Cong were doing was infiltrating villages and then attacking base camps. That was part of their... Oh, so the villages were filled with civilians. There were civilians, Vietnamese, uh, mostly people, Vietnamese, people who, when South Vietnam and North Vietnam split, lots of people left their homes, took whatever they could carry, and ended up in refugee villages all over South Vietnam. And so we had one outside of our base camp. And our base camp was, part of our job was to protect the air base. So there was a big air base there, Tan Sanut Air Base. And from time to time, you would get attacked. From time to time, I'm not sure if we ever got attacked or not, um, but we were always on guard. And um, so, when you would go out on patrol, what were some of the some of the things that you could run into? Oh well, the first time, uh, one time we went to play coup, and that was just a beautiful place. We walked through a mountain yard village. So you've seen in those magazines, natives walking around naked and stuff like that and living in huts. That was pretty cool. It's like National Geographic right there in front of you. And, um, and some of those people had never seen um, outsiders. And, um, and there was this, it was, I forgot what we went to kind of protect a special forces camp or something and we ended up swimming in a lake and having a good time and so that wasn't the worst time and then we were out I'll tell you about some of the incidences that we had um, the first major one for me was that I remember uh, was uh, we were on a patrol it was a search and destroy mission all of them were searching. So we had no idea what the hell we were doing. The officers got orders. They had maps. They knew where we were. They knew where we were going. Uh, there was a point actually in time where I didn't even know where on the planet I was. <laughs> you knew you were somewhere around <laughs> Vietnam, but that was about I, it. Yeah, it used to be called French Indochina, I think. And that I remember, but I never remember the word Vietnam. So really? that was a kind of like interesting figuring that one out. And um, so we went on a patrol one day, and we'd have been out in the field, I don't know, maybe a couple of days or something. And um, we're walking through the jungle, and our squad leader, who it's taken me 50 years to talk to, but he doesn't answer my phone calls anymore. I took him to dinner one day. We had a little chat. So we're walking along. I thought we were, I think we were in a line, you know, going that way. And, um, or we might have been spread out going that way. And um, he's over there walking around. And he says, Deport, come over here. I think I hear something. I said, you're crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to get over here. So he outranked me, and he was a squad leader. So I went out there. And uh, we hadn't been out there more than a minute or so, and all hell broke loose. And so people were screaming, and there were explosions and gunfire. And that was the first time that... Uh, I ever had any of that and there's bullets and shrapnel flying through the jungle and he and I hit the ground and we started crawling towards the rest of our squad or the rest of our platoon and then when we got there uh, a guy named Milton Olive who the shirt is uh, part of our, my mission is to tell that story uh, he's the first African American to be awarded the Medal of Honor in the Vietnam War and some people think he rolled over, some people think he jumped over, but it doesn't matter. Bottom line is he blew himself up with a grenade and saved four other people. 
And then I, uh, we got that back there, and I was looking at him. And somebody said, don't look at him. Let's put him on a pond. He was laying face down. His guts were hanging out of his body. Had the most peaceful look on his face. I am certain that he did that as a conscious decision. How can I be certain? Dove on a live Yeah, grenade. I can't be so certain, but uh, it could have been any one of us that would have done that, but he happened to be the one to do it. And then... Um, so they said, put him on a poncho, and let's get him out of the jungle. And so you take all your emotions, you stuff them down, and literally you have to pick up somebody that had become one of your best friends. And um, it didn't start out that way, but um, we carried him out and then put him down, and uh, you move on. And just to tell you a little bit about that story, um, he was black and from Mississippi. And I was white from South Carolina. And in 1964, he couldn't vote in Mississippi. He couldn't vote in South Carolina. And South Carolina was completely segregated, and so was Mississippi. But he could join the Army and go to Vietnam. And he got pretty active in the Civil Rights Movement. His father brought him up to Chicago and ultimately gave him the same choice as my mother gave me. And then the way I tell the story is the Army, in their infinite wisdom, put the two of us in a tent together and they made one fatal mistake. They forgot to send a counselor. So we had the same temperament and we kept poking each other. And fin finally we said one day, let's, let's solve this. So we went behind our tent. When the fight was over, he beat the white out of me, I beat the black out of him. The only thing left were men whose lives depended on each other. And that's a very powerful story because for a period of time, there was no such thing as racism in our squad. And when we're in the jungle, the Viet Cong were not particularly cared what religion, what race, how much money you had. It was indiscriminately, they would kill anybody that they could, and we would too. So, um, but that's um, but how that But you said that out. for a period of time there was none. So does that mean before that maybe there, was, there were some? I'm sure did you bring Olive any of I, that? Did, Olive and I had a little tension. <laughs> and we had black squad leaders, you know, and uh, I wasn't used to that. And... Um, where you were from was segregated. Where I was from was totally segregated. Yep, and you know when and you grew up believing the blacks were inferior. It was just the, you know, sort of like a taxi cab driver once said that all children are innocent until contaminated by the environment. So I wasn't per se a racist, but the environment was South Carolina and the civil. You know, like we were there was no such thing as a civil war. There was a war of northern aggression. And we were raised believing that the South would rise again. <laughs> it's like weird, but you know, that's the way it was. And you were 17, and so you brought 17, some of those yeah. and, and he thought was, processes he, with you. He, and he brought, you know, what his experience of, of what happened, and he'd gotten involved in the Civil Rights Movement and got stirred up, believing that he had the same rights that anybody else did. And, and so there were other people in our squad that didn't have that conflict, but he and I did for a little while. Um, and then, pretty much, there was no racism in our squad. So that was the first one. And then you just, um, I remember promised myself I'd call his father when I came back to Vietnam. Came back if I ever got back. But I didn't do it for 20 years. So when I came back, it was the height, the beginning of the anti-war movement. And I actually became an anti-war protester because by the time I left Vietnam, I could tell that the people that we just lost were wasted lives because we didn't capture any territory, we weren't making any progress, and we never were going to. I could tell then. So I pretty much was against uh, sacrificing anybody else's life in an unnecessary war that nobody seemed to have an intention to win. So but anyway, so that was that one. And then um, one day we're on a mission. And there was this kid named Fogel, and I have a picture of him. As he got shot in the chest, he had a bullet wound, and um, I think he was all of 17 or 18. And um, I think he lied to get into the service. He wasn't actually supposed to be in the field. And we're on a mission one day, and a mortar round fell short, and he got blown up by that mortar round. And he was one of our buddies. And little by little, they're starting to drop away. And then... And where were you when that mortar went off? I was somewhere out there in the field. 
but I wasn't like right by him. And so I don't know who was, and I don't know who who took his. I never was able to find his parents. I've never been able to communicate with anybody about him. Um, it's one of my missions. Uh, so, uh, so about 20 years later, when I came back, I found Milton Olive's parents in Chicago. And so, don't ask me how I did that, <laughs> but I did. And uh, I ended up having a conversation with his father a couple times and his stepmother a number of times. I stayed in touch with her for a couple of years. And um, I told them that I wanted to make that a national story, and they said, you've got my blessings. Now, there's other people that have not given me their blessings to do that, but I'm con continuing to make that an important story and what we went through in Vietnam is an important story. And, um, and so his father told me that there was a 173rd like reunion group, a Company B reunion group. So I went, I went to a couple of those and um, they were, uh, the first one I went to was pretty strange. I didn't know any of the people, and um, I didn't have a relationship with them for, per se, except the company commander was still being the company commander. Even years later, he still acts like he's a company commander. And um, I was in this room, and I just got overwhelmed, and I went into a separate room. It was like fear just left my body. And it was like I realized that that whole time that I was in Vietnam, it was underlying fear that you just never dealt with or addressed. And so you just pretended to blah, blah, blah. And then when I came back, being in the Vietnam War was not the most popular thing to do. So to deal with it, I just pretended. People say, how was it? Was, you know, there were, there were some, I had some great experiences. I, I have some lifetime friends, brothers, and I wouldn't trade it, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else. So um, I got in touch with them and blah, blah, blah. And I've, uh, one thing led to another, and I met this one buddy, Mark Mitchell. And he actually came here for one of my birthday, I think my 60th birthday or something like that. And um, then I met this guy named Grimes. I met a guy named Yates who lives in Alabama. He was in our squad. And then... I had this brilliant idea that I was going to put our squad together and we were going to have a reunion. In Chicago, there's a park named after Milton and there's a, a whole memorial there for him. And I decided we, nobody was doing anything. It was the 50th anniversary. So one thing led to another. I found short. It took me 50 years. <laughs> I always knew that he did horse racing, but I thought it was called charter horse racing but it was harness horse racing. And I was sitting right here in this office and they came to me, harness horse racing, North Carolina. I looked him up, they had him listed. I called him up, I said, do you know if he's about 70 years old and if he was in Vietnam? He said, well, he's probably over 70, but I don't know about the Vietnam War. He never talked about it. Hmm. So um, we got together and he he's actually up in the Poconos right now, racing horses and I actually roughed him about 10 times, worked on his body. His posture in Vietnam 50 years later was just as bad. <laughs> and um, anyway, we, we were buddies. And so that happened. And then the next big incident after Fogel was um, Playboy was having a promotion that if you bought a lifetime subscription to the magazine, that they would have a bunny send you their first copy, bring the first copy, deliver it. But they didn't have a but not in Vietnam exclusion. <laughs> really? So one of our officers got it together, we raised the money, we sent a letter off to Playboy, we said we wanted Joan Collins to come, and so I have a picture of that as well. And um, she came, and we were out in the field and they had to make up a phony mission for us to have us come back, so we were taking some Vietnamese refugees from one village to another. And as we were doing that, Harper was um, in the on the side of the road and he got blown up by a landmine. So he never made it back alive. And um, and that was sad because he was, a, I think he was a draftee. I don't remember per se, but I know that all he ever talked about is how much he loved his wife and family. 
how much he missed him. So that's another family that didn't have a father. And then um, the last big one that I was in uh, was March 16th, and it was a thing called Operation Silver City. And it was in this place called War Zone D. Now, they called it War Zone D because it was like a war zone. And that was the heart of where the Viet Cong were, the North Vietnamese Army was. And our job was to go out there and find them and then destroy them. And their job was to find us and destroy us. So we're, you know, walking through the jungle, I don't remember how many days, and we one day came across some um, fresh white rice, and it was still warm. And we saw some bunkers, so we knew that we were right in the place that we shouldn't be if we wanted to stay alive. And that night we set up a perimeter, and the next morning we, um, what did we do? Oh, it was my turn to go first. It's called Point Man. And this guy, Bochamp, who I have a picture of, uh, was arguing with me. He had more experience and he was going to go first. And this other guy said, no, I'm going to go first. And he went first. He started walking up the trail. And I was behind him. As he turned the corner, he got shot, but he didn't get killed. I blanked that out for over 50 years. I could have sworn on a stack of Bibles that Bochamp went first, but he didn't. And if I hadn't met up with Short, I'd never know that. And he yelled out, but in the moment that he got shot, the jungle erupted. It was like July 4th on steroids. Helicopter got shot down, AK-47s, machine guns, explosions, mortars, you name it. It was all going off at the same time. And we were out in the middle of the jungle between our people and the Viet Cong. And then, uh, sort of simultaneous to all that happening, Bochamp jumped up and said, I'm going to go get him. And Short yelled, no, don't. By the time Short said no, Bochamp had gotten killed. And there was nothing we could do to get either one of them back, so we had to leave them both there. So for 50 years, there's something called survivor's guilt. I didn't know what it was. But what it is is you might have survived, but you're guilty about it. So there's a sort of... You felt like, why was it them and not me? Exactly. And, the, and, I have, and I've been working on myself. I've been through every kind of human potential movement. I became a rolfer, a healer. I work on people. I have conversations about opening up, letting go, et cetera, et cetera. And fortunately, I've been able to get down to that one moment when I blocked out what happened and then could remember it and then let it go. So in your mind, they didn't get killed, or you didn't no, remember it, or they you did totally get, They did it. get killed, but we had to leave them there. That's the worst part. And you had, for, you had basically forgotten about that. No, I remembered leaving Bochamp. I didn't remember Zoints. I completely blocked out Zoints. I don't even remember him. I mean, I do now. And I remember the whole thing, you know, now that I kind of got back in touch with it, now I remember what happened. But in that moment, I blocked it all out. And you then said, we went on our merry way for a while. You said you didn't talk about it for 20 years. Why? What changed? What made you start? Well, <laughs> I was in this program called Landmark Education, and they had transitioned from another program called Air Hard Seminar Training. And the sort of mantra was, from complaint to possibility. And I kept saying, what are my complaints? I had a pretty good life then. I was rolfing people, making money, living well. And I realized that I felt guilty about not calling Milton's parents and telling him what actually happened. Other people had told him, but they weren't from our squad. And so nobody from our squad had ever reached out to his parents. So that, in that one moment, that one phone call is what made, began to make the difference. So you were, you said you were over there for two years. Two years. Yeah. Was it always going out on missions? What uh, no. or how the long were you actually? In I did the, that in for a year. I did that for a year, and then, as I was mentioning, I was watching this TV program. I was a, what was I? Oh yeah, I was 
a 19-year-old sergeant. <laughs> I might have been an acting sergeant by then, but I was a, nonetheless a sergeant, and, um, which is pretty ridiculous. And um, I'm, so I'm sitting in the non-commissioned officer's lounge watching this movie about infantry training in the snow. And uh, it was at Fort Carson, Colorado. And I remember looking at it and says, that does not look like fun. And it was bad enough being in warm weather. <laughs> Could not see doing that in snow because I'd never been in snow. And it just didn't look like fun. And I didn't like the cold anyway. And then a couple of weeks later, I got my orders to go back to Fort Carson, Colorado. <laughs> and I said, no, I can't do that. Just I remember, just look at it, I can't do that. And Even if it meant getting even, out of Vietnam? It, it did, well, you know, it wasn't that smart. <laughs> it wasn't that much thought in it. But it was like, I'd probably rather stay in Vietnam, not thinking about it. But my buddy Short had stayed for an extra six months, and he got sent to the admin um, part of the battalion and he was building schools or doing something in an orphanage and he would come back and he'd talk about you know what he's doing and stuff like that and what happened was he got wounded so he got put up there and um, so when I said looked at the order said well oh, short stayed and short was like my brother my big brother that I didn't really have even though I had a brother I was never very close to him but and then short and I were out on that mission when Bochamp and Zorns got killed. And um, and it was just a, a moment where it's just him and I and a few other people in that moment where that if we got out of there alive, God had some purpose for our lives. And um, so I said, yeah, I think I'll stay an extra six months. And our- In Vietnam. In Vietnam. And our platoon sergeant um, had been, our company first sergeant was now had been our platoon sergeant and he was one of the people that Olive had saved and he knew about our whole he knew about all the people that we lost in that year and I'd gotten the Bronze Star the, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry a Purple Heart and he said uh, as long as I'm in Vietnam you're not going to be in the field so he sent me up to headquarters and then I got to drive a Jeep again <laughs> this time I knew how to drive a Jeep and I did it for about a week or two for the guy who had been our platoon leader, and um, Clancy Johnson. And um, he was working in a, we were, it was a refugee village, and all I did was drive him around. And then one day he came out and said, Sergeant DePork, I'm going to Guadalupe, we we'll set up an R&R &R program there, and I'll be gone in a couple of days, you're going to take over, I'll show you what we're doing. Introduced me to the village priest and showed me what we we're doing and one thing led to another and I ended up staying there for 11 months and I was in charge of myself. I reported to the battalion commander once a month. I could come and go as I wanted. I got to build three schools, a playground, a health center. I got doctors to volunteer their time to, um, to treat people. We got dentists to volunteer their time on Saturdays to have us bring people to them. And we fed an orphanage once a week. And I had this beautiful Vietnamese interpreter. That wasn't bad. <laughs> and then the last month I was there, they replaced me with some officer. And he was like straight from officer training school or something like that. And by that time, our motto back in our squad was, we weren't soldiers, we were American fighting men. There was a difference. <laughs> and so we didn't salute, we didn't shine our boots, we didn't clean our bunks, you know, it was like, none of, none of that, you know, you don't spit and polish in Vietnam. So um, he came and he took over and I didn't salute him. He said, you don't salute, officer? I said, no, sir, we're in Vietnam. <laughs> it's all bull. <laughs> But, uh, and then he and I had a little run in and one day I said something to him like, um, you know, sir, people have been known to get blown up in their tents. <laughs> so are you threatening me? I said, no, 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 I would never do that. And then he said, I'm firing you. I said, you can't fire me. Well, why not? Because I quit. And so he took me to the battalion commander and um, he, we went through the same re regime and he said, I'm firing him. And the particular battalion commander loved me. He just, he knew what I was doing. He really appreciated the work that we were doing. 
and um, I've got lots of pictures that I'll send. And um, he said, do you have anything you want to say, Sergeant Pork? I said, yes, sir. You can't fire me. I quit. He said, you're right. And so he excused the officer. Then when the officer left, he said, why didn't you tell me? I would have gotten rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> so then they sent me out in the field again. And I only had about three weeks left. And I was clear that they were on a mission to get me killed. I did everything I could to get out of the field. I misbehaved. I fell asleep on guard duty, did anything I could. And so they sent me back to base camp. I had, I was restricted. They said, you're restricted to base camp. If you do anything, we're gonna perform. I said, don't worry, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm getting out of don't here worry alive. About that. Yeah, so, um, so that was pretty much um, that. And then um, I came back here to the United States ended up working in um, poverty programs for two years. Well, what was it like returning as a, as a Vietnam vet because... Uh, it's not fun. I mean, oh, you know what? Tell you the truth. Um, when, I was, I, when I was in Columbia, I went back to Fort Jackson, I was in Columbia. And looking back, all of my high school, a lot of my high school buddies had gone to the University of South Carolina and they had a fraternity. Somehow I linked up with them and all they did was drink. And so when I got off of work on Thursday afternoon, I went to a liquor store, bought a half a gallon of rum or whatever I was drinking those days, and I just got drunk for the whole week weekend. And I did that every weekend till I got out of Vietnam. And uh, so, you know, I could probably say, uh, it was just a way of not dealing with it. You know, I mean, and all I wanted to do was to fit in and be a regular person because I nobody really wanted to hear about the stories I've just told you, not in those days. And one of the things I'm working on is creating a book that's called um, Vietnam War. It'll be something like either it doesn't snow in Vietnam. <laughs> that's why I stayed the extra year or Vietnam War stories, healing the wounds of war. And um, uh, I had written a previous book, it's called um, Hands on Parenting, a uh, natural guide to happier, healthier, smarter kids. And I was at a publicity summit in New York and um, I was talking to some one of the CBS or NBC or somebody like that and I was telling her about Vietnam and she said, wow, well, if you could write a book that would help veterans talk about the war, I would help you support it. Well, that's two years ago. I haven't gotten it written yet, but I'm still working on it. I think now that I've dealt with that whole period of guilt, et cetera, et cetera, I can actually write it. And, um, and part of the purpose is to give veterans voices to talk and have their families have ears that can hear. Because a lot of people can't hear what veterans have to say, especially combat veterans. And I don't know if you know the suicides how many, kid, how many veterans are suicide? How many veterans, how many Vietnam veterans are um, homeless every day? Something like 133,000 are homeless at any period of time. So that's all a function of not being able to speak about it and not having people who know how to listen. And so that's one of my, all the human potential movement, all the rolfing things, all the seminars I've taken, all the acupuncture sessions I've taken have all gotten me to the point where I can actually talk about it and hopefully talk about it in a way that gives other people the ability to talk about their experiences. And, um, and in, a, in a way, see for a long time I was, I couldn't say the Pledge of Allegiance for at least 20 years. Because when I came back it was not one nation undivided. It was, and you know what, right now it's actually worse than it was when I went to Vietnam. The divisions, the pockets, in this country, it's just crazy. And um, so, you know, that phrase, one nation undivided, but we aren't an undivided nation. We still haven't, aren't undivided. And um, all you have to do is look at the newspaper and see what's happening every day. The violence, the poverty, the, um, you know, in, 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 in Philadelphia, and around the nation. I don't know if you know this, uh, half the kids in America can't read or write or do math proficiently. Did you know that? 
In Philadelphia, I have statistics on 153 of the lowest performing elementary schools. The math proficiency is 10%, reading proficiency is 23%, and I have the ability to go into any school, but I have no degrees. <laughs> The only degree I have is hands-on, having made a difference for thousands and thousands and thousands of people by distributing computers to them, um, teaching people how to develop their babies, et cetera, et cetera. So all that is, I don't know, um, you have to make up either an empowering context or a disempowering one. So the disempowering one is to be, I was actually, for when I look back, there was a period of time where you wouldn't understand. So I won't tell you. You know what I'm saying? And then I had to figure out a way to be able to talk about Vietnam as a contribution instead of like, why didn't you go? And, um, and you know, so that's what I'm working on. How to, how to talk about it as a contribution to people. And um, the m number one thing I learned is that war is not a fun thing to do and that we spent a long time in this country studying war and that we should spend as much time or more studying peace. If we could study peace and find out what what brings peace to people individually, you know, I mean, there's violent crimes happening every day. So what can we do as a nation, as a technology? You know, we go to the moon, but we can't teach kids how to read. We can't solve poverty. It's like crazy. So that's the mission I'm on. And Is that mission to educate children and bring computers to those who don't have them and all those types of things that you're involved in, is that a result, you think, of your Vietnam experience? Certain of it now. <laughs> so I did a course recently on, um, on the brain, taking care of my brain. There's a organization in Baltimore that talks about, that teaches about poverty in the brain, how the brain works and stuff like that. And they did this one week, one day course on taking care of your brain, understanding your brain. And what I understood was that there's a part of your brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is sort of like the palace guard. It tells you when there's danger. So I like, when I was growing up, lived a somewhat dangerous life where jumping out of trees, I stopped a train, blah, 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 we did, you know, smoking little rabbit tobacco and stuff like that. And so I kind of thrived on danger. But then in Vietnam, you get addicted to cortisol. So what happens when, you, when you're facing danger is cortisol kicks into your brain and that releases adrenaline. And so I became a cortisol adrenaline junkie. And so I've done great things in life and then failed. Kind of like there now. I'm 71, done great things, but I'm like at the bottom of the next mountain I'm climbing. And, and part of the thing that I learned in Vietnam was how to survive. And then I'm in, inadvertently am in enabling other people to survive or thrive or overcome their challenges. And I don't think that I would have led that kind of life had I not had those experiences in Vietnam. And now I can do it far more consciously than I ever could because I got that whole, uh, that whole thing about Zoinks and Bochamp and surviving that moment. And I mean, there was one, then when, after they got shot, we were hunkered down behind, some, I was behind a tree and the guy that shot them was trying to kill me. A bullet hit the tree behind me. I turned around and looked. I realized had I been kneeling differently, I, that bullet would have gone straight to my head. Then he jumped on the trail and I shot him. Now did I go out there and take his pulse? I didn't, but I'm pretty clear that I know that I killed one person. And then if you want to know what it feels like to kill somebody, you don't have any feelings, you know? But then you have a years of guilt because that's somebody's son, that somebody's, could be somebody's father, somebody, you know, whatever. And I'm a kind of sensitive person and that kind of, you know, I've been able to open up my senses. I've been blessed in life by being exposed to something called the human potential field. And I got a fellowship from the Fortown Foundation one time, I think I was 23. They usually don't give leadership development fellowships to high school dropouts. 
and I didn't have a college degree, and I still don't. And um, so I've been on a, a journey, and I've met some of the top thinkers on the planet and worked with them to open up my brain, open up my heart, open up, transform those experiences into something that'll make a difference. And, that, and you say that's your, your current mission. And that's my current mission. Uh, and my, my new book, um, I plan on making that book available all around the world. We just put together a brochure, and I'm looking for somebody to print it for me. Don't, everything I do gets donated. So I have a room full of people out there that are volunteers, and tomorrow we'll have 30 volunteers. And today Dunkin' Donuts donated a bunch of um, donuts, and tomorrow a restaurant, uh, Chick-fil-A, um, Hooters, um, Applebee's, a number of restaurants around here donate food like feed 30 people and um, I pull that off every week somehow and um, so it's a blessing to be alive and that's a blessing to be able to make a difference and so uh, I don't think I would have and you know I think the the as I say God works in mysterious ways and I said if you get me out of here alive that day there's some purpose to my life and then I ended up running in that and working in that village and the, the great thing about it is I had this interpreter. I picked her up every day, this beautiful Vietnamese 19-year-old woman, and I became friends with her family. And I left abruptly. And then for 50 years, I mean, I was with this woman every day, or once a week at least, for almost a year. And then one day, this guy fires me, or I quit, and I never went back to say goodbye. And I could picture in my mind exactly where they lived. And I was going to go back to Vietnam to find them. One day this guy named Russ Katz was writing a book because the person who was cutting his hair down in Alexandria, Virginia at a hair cuttery was my interpreter's sister. Hmm. I said, you got to be kidding me. So I wrote this book called The Principal's Daughter and in it there's a whole chapter about me working in that village. And her sister, Kim, couldn't have been more than nine when I was doing what I was doing. She remembered my blue eyes. She remembered my name because it was tattooed on my thing to pork. And they had a dog, and I would go, and the dog would bark at me, and I'd bark at the back of the dog. <laughs> and so she remembered, she remembered that. that. And her sister lives in Alexandria, Virginia, and a couple of years ago, I went down there and got together with them for the first time in 50 years, and I've got some pictures of them too. And um, I was down there about a month and a half ago, and Kim gave me a haircut. Now that is a transformed life. You can make those connections, get together with those people, share those stories, and whenever I get together with my with my buddies from Vietnam, it's like, are you sure that I was there? Because <laughs> they remember things that I don't even remember. They remember, you remember this, remember that? And they're like, I don't remember some of those things, but they, they have all these little stories about when we were doing this and when we were doing that. And um, they remember me being a pack rat, so I would throw ammo out of my sack and stuff it with sea rations. <laughs> and uh, well, not the smartest thing in the world, but anyway, we never ran out of ammo. Um, and um, are those beneficial? Those when you meet up with your your old buddies, is that good for you? There is nothing like being home again. It's it's indescribable. Oh, I I, I, I it, so we got together in Chicago, and Yates is this tall black guy, and he was friends with Olive for a while before Olive got killed, and. He was not in the field when Olive got killed. He was back in base camp doing kitchen patrol, cleaning dishes and stuff like that. And he felt guilty for 50 years. And he could never tell anybody. He didn't even know that he felt guilty for 50 years until we were together. And then on March 16th, when Bochamp and Zoinks got killed, he got shot in the arm. And he was bleeding pretty bad. And Mark Mitchell, this little white guy, put him on his shoulder and he's carrying him out to be evacuated. 
and there were bullets flying all around. <laughs> he said, he's trying to kill me. <laughs> He never, and you know, Mitchell put him down. He got evacuated. They never said goodbye. He never got to say thank you. So by putting them together, we got that conversation completed. And in Chicago, I had my son and my sister there. My sister passed away a couple years ago. and But she was at that reunion, and one night, somebody gave us a dinner at the Union League in Chicago after our event. And I invited a bunch of people and nobody wanted to come. So it just ended up being the five of us, my son, my sister, and one other guy. And after a couple of glasses of wine, the story started flying and, hey, you remember this, remember that? And I was, my sister was sitting there like, and so it was just like great to be able to have her have an experience of who I was with and why I'm like <laughs> the way I am. <laughs> and then my son has been hearing these stories forever. He was like, totally move. So, yeah, every time we get together, it's like, um, you know, being with people who's, who's where your life depended on each other, literally, day after day after day, and that we're still lucky to be alive, and it's a great, great experience for me, for them. And then I put together conference calls every once in a while, like Memorial Day, Veterans Day. Yep. Well, we thank you for taking the time to tell us about your story. You're Robert Toporek, thank you very much. Thank you.